Let's look at the properties of an account balance and how they differ from that of a class of transaction. You know that account balances all sit in the statement of financial position. And therefore we know that they are assets, liabilities and equity. Okay, because each of these actually can be physically shown or physically, physically proved as existing at a specific date, at year end, as opposed to your transaction which just literally moved through during the year. So if we look at what sits in this account balance, you would have potentially an opening balance, which is brought forward from the prior year. Then you would have transactions that were initiated during the current year and affect this balance, but ultimately could also no longer be applicable within this closing amount. So your additions and then disposals. You would actually go and add your dis additions and remove your disposals. And then, because of the accounting framework with regards to account balances, that generally has a subsequent measurement element to that account balance, so that the actual year-end balance is fair and reasonable, there will be these adjustments. So, looking at your assets, you're thinking of depreciation, impairment, revaluations, fair value adjustments, amortization, allowance for credit losses, obsolete provisions. Okay, so all of those adjustments that need to be processed according to IFRS to bring that closing amount to its fair or reasonable amount. So these would all then be deductions. If we're thinking of our liabilities, what would this in terms of remeasurement be? There isn't a remeasurement element because liabilities need to be shown at the month which they owe. So where there would be a change in that closing amount for liability would be in terms of transactions. Interest would be the transaction. Repayments would be a transaction. So those would fit over here with regards to those additions or disposals. And then you sit with the closing balance, which is ultimately just a balancing figure, taking the opening working with the transactions, working with the remeasurement, so that this closing amount is really the fair value of this balance, or a reasonable value for this balance. So, when we are looking at account balances, you've got to see the big picture here, guys. It's not just this amount here that's the closing. There's elements that make up this account balance, and we've got to see that the opening balance is part of that. These additions and disposals are transactions that need to be incorporated into getting to that closing amount. And then you've got this subsequent measurement. So now, when you need to audit a closing balance, or an account balance for that matter, you're going to have to do some work on this opening balance. So that's going to have to be a consideration. What are we going to do there? In terms of the additions and disposals, because I've said those are transactions, the group of additions and the group of disposals will have to be audited using your class of transaction assertions. Now remember, those are completeness, accuracy, occurrence, cutoff, classification. So all of those assertions would need to be tested for, each, or for your additions and then for your disposals.
And then there's going to have to be work on the subsequent measurements. And this subsequent measurement is done in order to bring the closing amount to the fair value. So this here is for valuation purposes. But now I know there are additional assertions that are relevant for account balances. So I'm going to have to do work on this closing to get evidence for those assertions' existence. Completeness. Rights and obligations. And for the entire set out presentation and disclosure in terms of the financials. But now thinking back to those class of transaction assertions that we've just done for any transaction or grouping, and looking at all of those assertions, now I'm saying if I have to test additions, testing all of those assertions, maybe there's 10 marks there. And then 10 marks available for doing the same for disposals. Now there's a couple of marks here for opening balances, a couple of marks here for valuation, so let's go and put it as 8. And then we've got these other assertions that we still have to get evidence for. So together let's put them at another 10 marks. So I'm showing you now how you could potentially be asked a question out of 50 marks for a balance because you're going to have marks for your general procedures at let's say 10. For your transactions, we've got 20 there. And then for your account balance assertions, we've got 20 there. 10, 8, and 2. Okay, so lots of work here when we're doing account balances. So let's go and have a look at your account balance assertions. Remember, I say 315, A129, old version, A190 newer version. They say completeness. All assets, liabilities and equity interests that should have been recorded have been recorded. So we can see how they're making it very specific to what an account balance is. Assets, liability or equity. So the total of revenue for the year Although you're adding all the transactions up and you're saying it could be a balance, it's not a balance because it doesn't roll forward to next year. We start a clean, fresh slate of transactions in the next period. But we don't with the debtor that still needs to settle. Okay, so what is the risk here? It's the risk that assets, liabilities and equity interests are understated. They're not recorded. For existence, assets, liabilities, and equity interests exist. So the risk is that they're recorded but shouldn't have been. Valuation and allocation. Assets, liabilities, and equity interests are included in the financial statements at appropriate amounts and any resulting valuation or allocation adjustments are appropriately recorded. So. The risk here that it's recorded, the incorrect amount, and adjustments are incorrect too. So this is where we can see now that the valuation assertion is the assertion that's dealing with those re-measurements, subsequent measurements. Because it's talking about any resulting adjustments being recorded. So we can see that an allowance for credit losses or depreciation or impairment, those are not transactions. They form part of the valuation of a balance. Rights and obligations. The entity holds or controls all rights to assets and liabilities are the obligations of the entity. So the risk here is that they don't have the rights to assets, 
or they have the right to assets and they don't record. And then for liabilities, they don't have the obligation and they record it. Or they have the obligation and don't record it. So ultimately it could work either way for the assets or the liability. They have the rights but they don't record the assets or they don't have the rights but they do record the assets or with the liability they have the obligation and they don't record it or they don't have the obligation but they do record it. Okay, and then presentation and disclosure, it's just the risk that it's not presented and disclosed according to EFRIS. So, once again, each of these will result in the balance being either over or understated. That's non-negotiable. So it's now just being able to see which of these assertions falls under potentially overstating or understating, so that again, when I'm in a question, I can then go and see, oh, they intentionally want to overstate, so they could do it in these different ways, affecting these different assertions. Right, so, they could record fictitious or duplicate assets or liabilities or equity, which would then mean they don't exist. So it's the existence assertion. Or they record the amount too high. And that could be on initial or subsequent recording. So this is the valuation assertion. Or they don't have the right or obligation for a liability and asset, but they record it. So obviously this is rights and obligations. And that would result in them overstating assets and liabilities. Whereas with understating, they don't record, so completeness assertion is therefore affected. And that means that an asset or liability or equity is understated because they have not recorded it. Or they recorded it too low an amount. So valuation now, in terms of subsequent measurement, subsequent measurement is too small, the adjustment resulting in the amount being too little. Or... They have the right and obligation, but they don't record it. So, once again, rights and obligations. But now we can see, where do the risks lie with the question? Is it the risk that they're going to overstate, or is it the risk that they would understate? And remembering that there's always the risk for both in terms of error. It's only with fraud that you can see the, where the intention lies to overstate or understate. But there's always the risk that by mistake they understate even though they will intentionally want to overstate because of a fraud risk. 